Hello and welcome to Creative Women, Creative Business, Feminist Publishing, Design and Comics, a three-day festival organised by the Business of Women's Words Research Project in collaboration with the British Library. My name is Polly Russell and I'm the British Library Partner for Business of Women's Words and also the lead curator for the Library's current exhibition, Unfinished Business, The Fight for Women's Rights. The exhibition connects the current moment of feminist activism and protest with the longer and fascinating history of women's fights for rights in the UK. It tells a story which is bold, dramatic, colourful and lively, and it does so with more than 180 objects, including film, sound, manuscript, costumes, letters, banners and posters. Unfinished Business will be open until summer 2021, so please visit in person if you can. If not, though, then check out the Unfinished Business digital exhibition on the British Library's website, which includes more than 100 digitised objects with accompanying essays. There's also an exhibition podcast series and a whole host of wonderful associated events, including this festival. Again, to find out more, look on the British Library's website. But back to today and to the festival. It is incredibly fitting that Creative Women, Creative Business is accompanying the exhibition. Because although Unfinished Business appears to tell the story of women's struggles, what it actually does is celebrate women's incredible creativity. Whether in different forms of protest and resistance, or in finding ways to carve out space and be taken seriously, creativity has been a hallmark of women's fights for rights. And of course, in publishing, writing and illustration, these have been crucial ways that women have harnessed forms of creativity to profit, profit in the sense of being heard, being able to challenge and change the world, and of course, to profit to make money. This is going to be a thrilling three days of events. Join us for as many as you can. We can't wait to hear from our speakers and we can't wait to hear from you. Now, over to Margareta Jolly, the Business of Women's World project lead and the festival organizer. Welcome to this first event in our wonderful festival of women's creativity and enterprise, Creative Women, Creative Business. In these sessions, we'll share ideas and experiences from women active in publishing, design and comics. We'll also ask what lies behind our favorite feminist writers, bestsellers, classics, magazines, podcasts and shows and meet some of those making it all happen. We'll also ask what it takes to get a job in the feminist creative industries. And crucially, how to uphold your ideals while doing business once you've got there. This festival is brought to you by the Business of Women's Words. Our project that's exploring the dramatic story of the feminist publishing revolution of the UK women's liberation movement of the 1970s and 80s. Through our work, we've discovered a host of ways that feminists have created ethical enterprises and fought for greater equality, justice and inclusion in the wider business world. Our project is based at the University of Sussex, where I work as a professor of cultural studies. It's a partnership between Sussex, the University of Cambridge and the British Library, funded by the Levy Hume Trust, for whom, of course, we're very grateful. Our festival is kick-started by two brilliant women. First, you will hear from Charmaine Lovegrove and she'll be followed by Lenny Goodings. Charmaine Lovegrove is the publisher of Dialogue Books, part of the Little Brown division of Hachette UK. It's home for a variety of stories from illuminating voices often missing from the mainstream. Charmaine has worked in press relations, book selling, events management and TV scouting. She was the literary editor of Elle magazine. Moving to Berlin, she set up her own bookshop and creative agency. Charmaine's contributions were recognized with the Future Book Publishing Person of the Year Award, 2018 to 19. She serves on the boards of the Black Cultural Archives, Watershed in Bristol, and is a founding organizer of the Black Writers Guild. Charmaine is proud to be part of the African diaspora and books make her feel part of the world. Our second brilliant speaker is Lenny Goodings. Lenny is the chair of Virago, the legendary publisher of books by women. 
She's a writer as well, and her terrific memoir was published earlier this year, A Bite of the Apple, A Life with Books, Writers and Virago. Lenny was part of the management buyout team who created a newly independent Virago in 1987, and she later became the publishing director. In 1995, Virago was sold to Little Brown, where she remained the publisher and editorial director. Lenny's contributions were recognised with the Booksellers Industry Award, Editor and Imprint of the Year 2010, and a Lifetimes Achievement Award at the Women of the World Festival in 2018. This year, she's become an Honorary Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. Born in Canada, she's lived in London since her early 20s, and working with authors and books is her passion. I wholly believe that the publishing industry um, is a wonderful mechanism between writers and readers. Creating, producing and selling books from the incredible minds that write them and illustrate them into the hands of readers who lap up stories and consider rich narratives which are affecting and arresting. To that end, my start in the publishing industry was when I was 15 years old and I got a part-time job in a bookshop in Battersea, South West London, which is where I grew up. I'd known since I was eight years old that I wanted to work with books. And I recall being handed a brown paper bag with a copy of Boy by Roald Dahl and thinking that I wanted my life's work to make people this happy. So I aspired to be a bookseller. Working in Battersea, I had an array of customers, from new parents eager to occupy their kids with picture books to readers of literature who came across the bridge from Chelsea or across Clapham Common. There was something for everyone in that bookshop. And what I learned then, and I really hold on to now, is that the maxim, you should never judge a book by its cover, is the same for readers. You can't always tell what someone in, is interested in just because of what they look like. I've sold Doris Lessing to older black men in their 50s, crime fiction to teenage girls, French literary translation to taxi drivers and sci-fi to women over 70. The beauty of reading is that you can get lost in worlds and ha that have been created and imagined and it's between you and that narrative. It's a private form of expression that as booksellers, I think we had a really great privilege to witness. Following being a bookseller in Battersea, I worked in secondhand bookstalls under Waterloo Bridge, then Waterstones in Edinburgh, Foils and Charing Cross Road, and the London Review Bookshop in Bloomsbury. I love selling books. I love creating libraries for people and I love repeat customers who come back and they're often excited and sometimes disappointed in what they've read. Even if they didn't like a book, there was always something to learn. And I would implore the experience wasn't wasted as all books give you something to consider and stay with you throughout your life. After a long time of bookselling, I thought I might be better suited to publicity, and I got a job um, with the incredible Fiona McMurray at FMCM Associates, and I learned the art of getting readers to hear about books that they would then buy from bookshops, creating events, going um, on book shop signing tours, pitching to newspapers for critics to review. Publicity is a really fast paced and multifaceted role. And although it was a steep and challenging learning curve, I really loved it. However, there was something missing for me and that was the deep knowledge of being able to talk about and think about hundreds of books in a day and not just the books that I'd been assigned to. And I knew that in the end, my future lay in bookshops. After trying to get a loan from a bank to open a bookshop in London Fields before it was trendy, um, I set my sights further afield and travelled to France, Italy, Spain and Germany, looking for a place that I could live and open a bookshop. The reasons for those countries is because of the netbook agreement. In the UK, um, publishers decided that the recommended retail price on the back of the book um, could be determined by the retailer, which allowed the market to open up to Amazon and supermarkets. In European countries, the price of the book was the same wherever you bought it from. 
So I felt that I would have a better chance in succeeding in my bookshop if the commercial market was fair. And if I failed, it wasn't because of Amazon. It was because I hadn't connected with my audience. Looking back now as someone with a small income and no investment and no family, it was a wild dream. But I was determined to have a bookshop in a country that knew the value of literature. And after some deliberation, I chose Berlin and Germany. Dialogue was supposed to be a working title, um, but I found that after um, I found a space for my bookshop to start in the back of a tea rooms in Mitte, the central district of the German capital, the name stuck and Dialogue Books was established. Using my years of experience as a bookseller, um, I already knew how to think beyond my taste and I'd saved £5,000 over the previous winter. I learned on the job how to run a business, how to plan, budget, publicise and also market my business. In Germany, to get a business license, you need certain qualifications. And luckily, I had over seven years of bookselling um, experience in the UK, which they deemed akin to doing a bookseller's apprenticeship. And um, so I was able to move forward and set up my shop. This literal stamp of approval also gave me the confidence I needed in starting my business in a country that I barely knew and a language I hardly spoke. Having a unique selling point for Dialogue was really, really important. So Dialogue was the first new English language bookshop in Berlin. This meant we only sold new books, not secondhand. Even then I was interested in an ecosystem where the book sales went directly back to the author and the publisher. With second-hand books, the sales go directly to the shop, and I've always been interested in the wider picture of publishing rather than my own gains. One customer said of Dialogue, this bookshop is where you come in Germany to find the best French philosophy. <laughs> One customer said of Dialogue, this bookshop is where you come in Germany to find the best French philosophy and Italian criticism translated into English, and I am very proud of that. Part of having something original and unique meant that I could partner with interesting companies. For example, we had our coffee machine and all our beans from Illy Coffee for free. And so I could give free coffee to customers as they browsed. Very early on, we partnered with Soho House to create the Dialogue Literary Lounge, where we hosted authors such as Jonathan Coe, Rufa Zeki, Jonathan Leafham, Claire Massoud, and Taya Selassie. We hosted the lounge monthly for five years. The Literary Salon has long been a tradition in Berlin. It has its roots in Jewish women during the Weimar Republic, opening their homes to discussion and the arts. I was very proud to be part of a generation who carried on that tradition, inviting hundreds of people to an opulent space each month to listen and participate in ideas from writers. Being innovative whilst learning from the past has been a core strength of dialogue. As a company, we have had many different guises. What started as a bookshop became a publishing consultancy called Dialogue Berlin, where we worked with a range of different brands and companies to enhance their English language and innovate their publishing of offerings. One of our clients, Ufa, the largest production company in Germany, asked me to find new stories for them. So I used to go into my bookshop and think about books that would be the right fit. Um, and then I'd look in the acknowledgements page and find agents um, in the back. And then I would call the agents and ask them if they had screen rights, um, if they were available to each of the books. Unbeknownst to me, um, as this is entirely <laughs> made up, um, this was actually a job and I really, really enjoyed it. I found it fascinating elevating my skills from the bookshop floor of finding the perfect books for readers to finding the perfect stories to be adapted to screen. Having lived in Berlin for seven years, I really wanted to enhance um, what I could do and also take the opportunity to learn from people who had been pub in publishing for much longer than me. 
working in a small but yet brilliant team in Berlin was amazing but I had to acknowledge that I had started so young I was 27 when I started my bookshop and I needed to learn um, from more professional um, practices and more and from other people it was really important to me that um, I didn't kind of languish in what I already knew and that was a huge um, acknowledgement for me I also wanted to see more what I could do and was lucky enough that um, London is my home. So I took the plunge of moving back in summer 2014 with my husband and son. Um, we closed the bookshop and I started working full time as a scout for Fremantle. Um, it was the first time for the company to employ a scout and to have someone like myself. Um, there were two others in the industry. One person worked for the BBC and another for a large production company. So this is a really new area. For Fremantle, I worked with 28 different territories, finding stories to be adapted, but also coming up with trends and ideas to follow. It was clear that the publishing model was slower than making television. Um, what was being discussed could influence what we watched in two years time. And I wanted to be the person to help connect the two. Um, it was an incredible to be home as London is so vibrant. It's really multicultural and I understood and importantly could easily access everything that was happening. Although my German had got a lot better in Germany there, you know, there really is no place like home. So after a year of working for Fremantle, um, I met Toby Coventry, who was on the cusp of starting his own consultancy, and we decided to join forces and create Dialogue Scouting. <laughs> As you can see, Dialogue, the word, um, has been a really important um, part of my life, and that connection of like the conversation between two parts is, um, is, is what I think we all live for. It was incredible to be a scout, um, being the first and only consultancy which specialised in finding books that could be adapted into film and television in London was a very special thing to create. We were a formidable team of three, um, having bought um, my assistant, Kate Loftus O'Brien, over um, from Berlin um, with me. Um, she continued to work with me the whole time um, whilst I was at UFA and again, um, a dialogue scouting. And I'm really proud of both of them who now have their own companies and are doing exceedingly well. So during this time when we started Dialogue Scouting, Elle Magazine approached me and asked me to be their literary editor. It was a great crossover as I was able to uh, find another place to keep amplifying the stories that I believed in. For me, it's really important to share all of this with you as the question um, of this event is what is being a game changer. Often my appointment of publisher of dialogue books is seen as radical as I didn't start within a publishing house. I, however, see my appointment as necessary. As you have heard, although I've done many jobs, um, they've all really been about the same thing, connecting readers and authors, connecting ideas and inspirations and connecting knowledge with empowerment. When after a publishing dinner and drinks, I got talking to Charlie King, the MD of Little Brown, um, the literary editor, um, sorry, the literary agent, Julia Kingsford, and Philip Jones, the editor of trade magazine, The Bookseller, um, about how appalling um, the, the, the stats around um, black, Asian and marginalized ethnic people within the publishing industry and as authors were. There was this stat that really stood out that was out of 160, 5,000 books that were published in 2016, less than 100 were by people of colour and only one black male debut was published. I'd recently seen the um, BBC Virago documentary and was really inspired by its establishment and how empowering the vision to change publishing um, forever was and you know to include women I just thought that was absolutely incredible and I knew that um, Virago was at Little Brown and so I said to Charlie I felt that we needed um, a similar imprint for um, underrepresented voices and the seed that I had never considered dialogue books as an imprint was planted. I never thought that I would do the job. I thought that we would find someone 
in the industry um, who was um, able to spearhead the um, imprint. But it became both um, an honor of my life and also truly bewildering that in 2017, I became the first black publisher in a corporate publishing house. The incredible women who have come before me, such as Margaret Busby of Alison Busby, um, Valerie Brandes of Jacaranda, and BB um, Bakara Youssef of Cassava Books are the cornerstone of incredible independent publishing. And there are many, many more, especially black women independent publishers. My true hero is Toni Morrison, um, who took her place at Penguin Random House before coming an or before becoming an author. Um, Toni Morrison stood absolutely firm and true within a big corporate environment um, and towards her, her need to publish for black people um, and for black people to have the opportunity to tell our stories. And I look towards Toni Morrison, her work, but her practice as a publisher and editor greatly um, in the work that I do. I also, of course, look to my colleagues at Virago and Lenny, who I'm really pleased to share this stage with, um, and everything that Virago has done as a sister imprint. Um, um, I am truly honoured to, to share a, a place with them amongst being an activist imprint. So true to its roots, dialogue is all about being inclusive, inspiring and innovative with bold covers celebrating the characters and intentions of the authors and illuminating and inspiring publicity and marketing campaigns that are underpinned by our act activism, which is absolutely at the core of what we're doing, and our desire for equality, equity and civil rights. Um, as a team, and I'm so grateful for my team, um, we really centre our authors and our aim is to bring exceptional narratives such as um, The Banishing Half by Britt Bennett, Nudie Brank by Irina Sinekoji, Rainbow Milk by Paul Mendez, or The Old Slave and the Mastiff by Patrick Shamazo. And we hope that these books will leave an indelible imprint on thousands of readers. We have a long way to go to reach the goals of um, what I would consider to be fair and equal um, in publishing. But I am hugely proud of um, the work that I do alongside my publishing. Um, and I'm very lucky to be supported by Hachette as a company and to be patron of Changing the Story, which is our inclusive um, inclusivity initiative within the company. Um, it's a really huge challenge, but for us to do things like bringing the ethnicity pay gap forward um, before any other publishing house, um, before the government have requested it, um, for the trainee sheet schemes that we've set up, um, and just many, you know, all of the different um, initiatives that have come from our networks that are concerned with the equality of different protected characteristics across the company. Um, it's just an incredible place to work and dialogue is absolutely in the right home being at Hasha and Little Brown. I'm also incredibly proud of the work um, in setting up the Black Writers Guild um, with my co-founders and co-organizers. It's a huge amount of work. Um, that started last summer following the murder of George Floyd and us asking questions around what does it mean to be black within um, a publishing industry and framework and within the United Kingdom um, and understanding the forces of sort of white supremacy and how that has hindered our progress over many, many years and um, coming together as a group um, of over 200 writers to say no more. Our voices should be heard, um, our story should be told and we should also be employed. I am really looking forward to a day where I'm no longer the only black publisher, where there are many black publishers across corporate publishing houses, many more editors, sales, um, production, <laughs> heads of production, heads of all different departments, people on the boards um, and CEOs that come from a wider range of backgrounds than we currently have. We're not at the beginning. As I said, many more people have been on this journey for much longer than me. Um, and 
there's lots of people like the black agents and editors that are working tirelessly to ensure equality um, um, within our industry. And then there's institutions such as the Publishers Association, um, the um, Agents Association, and also the Arts Council who have kind of set their goals um, with integrity towards equality. And so as a game changer, I suppose I feel I am really part of this um, movement for change. And I just hope that by the time that my, my child and my nieces and nephews are ready to, who are sort of eight, nine, 10, by the time they're ready to enter the workforce, that w they won't know what inequality will look like. And I hope that for all the writers who are writing the books, um, that they will not have um, the, the same barriers to entry and that as an industry, we can open the doors and let the inspiration, imagination and um, innovation um, be free. Thank you very much. Unfinished business, how Virago and the other feminist presses were game changers in the world of publishing and reading. Hello, and thank you so much to the Business of the Women's Word Project and the British Library for inviting me to give this talk about Virago, the feminist press, begun by Carmen Khalil in 1973 and where I have worked for over 40 years and about which I have written a book, A Bite of the Apple. This talk is a celebration of writing, of reading, and of the joys and challenges of the business of publishing. At Virago, as publicist, editor, publisher, and now as chair, literature, feminism, business, writers, and politics are my daily bread, and I love it. I want to talk about what I believe. Feminism has changed the world and radicalized writing, reading, and the publishing industry. I take you back just five years before I joined to set the scene of the year that Virago was founded and to show you why this revolution in publishing was so game-changing. 1973 was a dramatic time of political change. The Western world on the cusp of power shifts. Watergate was about to bring down President Nixon. It was three years from the UK Equal Pay Act and in a tennis match billed as the Battle of the Sexes, Billie Jean King accepted the challenge from Bobby Riggs. The female sex won. Creating a book list with a political and philosophical mission gives a publishing house tremendous energy and purpose. Virago and the other feminist houses published instinctively, knowing that there was a hungry readership for their books. Carmen Khalil, Ursula Owen and Harriet Spicer, the original three, shared their readers' concerns, quests, and passions. Beginning on the crest of the women's liberation movement, Virago was almost immediately recognized as a living and breathing realization of many readers' wants and desires. Women wanted a voice. Women wanted to understand their history. Women wanted to see themselves on the page. Women wanted a champion. Though the 1960s had heralded a social revolution, many women felt they had been left out, not asked, not represented, not heard. Carmen Khalil said, I was inspired by the underground press's lack of engagement with women's ideas, their works, their opinions, their history. Their opinion sounds almost tame compared to the other noble pursuits, ideas, work, history in her list, but it was key to the sense of the time. Women were just not listened to. Hashtag Me Too and other feminist campaigns of many decades focuses on the power of breaking the silence with the female voice. One that is even now still muted in some places, some industries and some countries opinions. Part of the women's movement was women discovering for themselves that they had opinions. Virago was about to publish those opinions. From the beginning, Virago challenged the idea of niche publishing 
a niche market. Virago's first catalogue announced, there is a specialist publishing imprint for almost everything, except for 52% of the population, women, an exciting new imprint for both sexes in a changing world. That refusal to be seen as marginal, the desire to inspire, educate, and entertain all women and men too, to bring women's issues and stories into the mainstream. These passions and beliefs were the bedrock of Virago. And that attitude remains ours today. Virago, publishing stories not heard before or about lives and subjects formerly not deemed worthy of print, showed there was an audience previously not listened to. Then, like now, the feminist stereotype existed, but it was too late for these naysayers. Women who worked in newspapers, radio, libraries, bookshops, schools, and universities were hungry for news of the books we and the other feminist presses were publishing. We had enthusiastic supporters, men as well as women, and it meant our books could blast through the cultural gatekeepers. Virago means heroic, warlike woman. It was provocative, outrageous, and fun too. We did everything ourselves. We typed, we packed the books, we licked the stamps, we dragged bags full of review copies down the four flights of stairs from our Wardour Street office in Soho. We also took turns cleaning the office. One Friday night, not long after I had joined, I was late, still working, and it was Carmen's turn. While she was cleaning a telephone, I asked, why did you start Virago? The answer came in a beat, to change the world, darling. That's why I knew I was in the right place. Out on the streets were feminist politics. The personal was political, but in the publishing boardrooms were mainly white Oxbridge men. Lots of women, as now, but not with power, and very few people of color. In publishing, the editors are the first gatekeepers. If a manuscript or a story or experience speaks to them, they believe it will have a market and they bring the book to acquisitions where the next gatekeepers, finance, sales, marketing, publicity, and CEO sit and judge. The salespeople will be anticipating the bookshop gatekeepers. The publicity people will anticipate the press. It is easy, therefore, to be conservative, to go with what's already working, already selling. In fact, the hardest thing an editor is up against is when they know and therefore say at these meetings, there is almost nothing on the bookshelves like this. This is utterly original. This is a new voice we have not yet heard enough of. That leaves the gatekeepers without any reference points. And so even though they may say, let's publish, they will be cautious, unambitious. I have come to believe that it is only social movements that change publishing. Publishing, like most industries and institutions, is effectively devoted to the status quo. It is the default position. Publishing really only changes itself, changes who gets published, who works in publishing, and therefore what gets published. When social movements force the transformation. Feminism gave birth to publishing houses such as Virago and changed the face of publishing in the 70s and 80s. Now I watch and applaud Black Lives Matter, which is going to utterly radicalize the industry again. It takes an outside force, a social movement, to insist on change, to upset the status quo, to storm the gatekeepers of publishing, to go over the heads of decision makers. And the reason? Readers and writers. It's because social movements are made up of writers and readers who demand books that reflect and include them. Then publishing responds. It's a reader's revolution or even a book buyer's revolt. It's first a vanguard of readers and writers who identify with the movement for social change, 60s revolution, feminism, LGBTQ+, Black Lives Matter. But then that number of readers quickly expands until what was a niche group becomes a market, 
that publishers understand and respond to. And of course, it happens much faster when the decision-making people in publishing are part of the movement. Publishers are waking up to that now. When Virago and the other feminist publishers' houses started, we had our ear to the ground. We knew what was missing, women's stories and experiences. We were part of the feminist movement. We showed the big houses that there was a market and an interest not being satisfied. Virago published stories not heard before or about lives not deemed worthy of print or forgotten women writers. I feel very strongly that feminism benefits all genders and Virago was reaching out to all readers, but our mainstream stance was not appreciated by all. Radical activists accused of being the acceptable face of feminism. They criticized us for not being a cooperative, for aiming for and believing our books should be on the high street. Whereas the mainstream in the form of the press belittled us, calling us paper tigresses or feign delight and terror in going out for lunch with a virago. Idealistic notions fueled virago's founding and inform our choices today. But we're not a lobbying group or a charity. We are a business. We have to make a profit or we don't survive. We have to get our hands dirty. We have to compromise. We are not independent. We have to listen to sales and marketing. But to me, that aspect of Virago is what also excites me. It's challenging and it's real. Carmen said, the power to publish is a wonderful thing. Delight in power and that enthusiasm for the project in the early years meant those passions and politics alongside a scarcity of resources and anxiety to survive created tension. I am not going to lie, there was crying in the loo. Margaret Atwood, familiar with small publishing houses in Canada in the 1960s, dryly observed in the BBC4 documentary about Virago's history, in my experience, the smaller the cheese, the fiercer the mice. But two things propelled me. One, I was determined not to be defeated by it. And secondly, I believed we were doing something life-changing and game-changing. We were challenging people's notions of women's literature of what women could do, of the importance of women's stories and histories, and we were part of the feminist movement. I believed in that. Was the cost to some of us worth the gain? I would probably say yes, but I would also say I'm glad we don't have to operate like that now. However, ask any passionate, self-starting, ideological group about rows and difference of opinions and operating on a shoestring and I suspect you will find the same story. Over these years, probably close to 100 women have worked at Virago, and we published nigh on 4,000 titles and just over 1,000 authors. In Virago's first months, a reporter asked if Virago would find enough to publish the next year, as if. We were a highly effective outfit, and we all took great pleasure in that, despite our differing individual temperaments. Some radical presses were cooperatives with no shareholders. That was how some set up shop. Ours was a more traditional business model. Though there was a consensus on what we published, we each had an area of responsibility. Carmen knew about publicity and Ursula Owen knew about editing, but there were other skills that we had to learn from scratch. Carmen talks of poring over an article called Mr. Hopeful Starts a Publishing Business and how she learned about reading balance sheets with help from Sunny Mehta, then at Picador. Harriet Spicer leaned on printers and typesetters to learn the art of production. Our advisor group was not only called upon to suggest books and authors, but were asked about rights, contracts and sales. We had a traditional business model, but it was powered by idealism and altruism. Workers and authors gave their all to the company, taking low advances and wages and working long hours. Authors were very much on our side from the start. Cynicism or opportunism, 
those have never been Virago motivations. And over the 40 plus years that Virago editors have chosen the books to publish, their guiding principle has always been to ask, what does this do to champion women's talent? Or what truths does it tell about women's lives? But not without an eye to success and profit, because from the beginning, Virago has wanted to prove that the business of publishing books by women is a profitable enterprise and that the very existence of Virago shows the world that a feminist business would work, that women's writing could be the foundation of an inspirational, financially viable list. To stay alive, to publish, you have to make a profit. And now when Virago is part of a larger publishing conglomerate, we've been with the Little Brown Book Group since 1995, profit is still our protection. But being part of a group also means we no longer have to run strictly on passion. It means we've been able to do what is right, pay staff and authors profit, properly, and still be profitable. Over the years, we have set trends, such as reclaiming women's history and literature with the Virago Modern Classics, and followed the political mood, such as publishing feminist polemic in more recent times with feminism's fourth and fifth wave. Virago has had seven incarnations. It began in association with Quartet, then became independent with shareholders, then sold itself to become part of Chateau, Virago, Bodley Head and Cape, which then sold itself to Random House. We then did a management buyout with Rothschild Ventures, with 50% of the shares held by directors, which kept us independent for eight years before selling ourselves in 1995 to become an imprint of Little Brown, then owned by Time Warner, who then sold Little Brown and all the imprints to Hachette, where we remain today. Our different business models have been partly in response to the trade and have afforded us different benefits and disadvantages. But our final move in 1995 has been a good and stable one for us. That wouldn't have been the case if Little Brown, Hachette, had not respected the philosophy behind Virago, and also crucially, if we hadn't already proved ourselves to be good at knowing our audience, at choosing excellent books, and understanding how to market ourselves. The word brand is something that makes me queasy with its commodification associations. It's flattening out of complexity of meaning and its apparently cynical eye for the marketplace. So instead, I might use the word reputation. But what I mean with the words brand or reputation is respect and loyalty and authenticity. The media, booksellers and readers know that our name stands for quality writing by women. Even people who don't read know that Virago stands for feminism. This reputation is not one we take lightly, and it's something that must be burnished and refreshed. We have a heritage, but we must stay up to date. We must publish with relevance, and we must reach the market in the ways that today's readers respond to, Twitter, Instagram, websites, and most recently, a Virago website from which we can sell our books direct to readers. Like any brand, we can't assume undying loyalty and in, in an attention-scarce marketplace, but we draw great strength from our name and reputation. Virago lives within the tension between idealism and pragmatism, between sisterhood and celebrity, between art and commerce, between behaving independently, but for over 25 years part of a conglomerate between watching feminism wax and wane and then become popular again, at the same time knowing so many of the battles are still to be won. When we sold ourselves in 1995, we said, let's vote for the course that will keep Virago going at least for the next 10 years. We're still here. Almost the only feminist press left from the 1970s and instead of thriving for just another 10 years, it's been 25 and we're still going strong. With the sale, we got what we needed, capital, 
might in the market, and an international reach. I turn now to the books themselves. We publish and continue to publish the Virago Modern Classics, the series that challenged what is deemed great literature. When the classics, our reprint series of forgotten 19th and 20th century authors, started in 1987, only four or five women were really thought worthy of the literary canon. Austen, Eliot, the Brontes, Wolfe. The Virago Modern Classics list challenged that and also demonstrated a female literary tradition, a line of women writers who stood on each other's shoulders but had been neglected. Rebecca West, Antonia White, Edith Wharton, Willa Cather, Anne Petrie, Zora Neale Hurston, among hundreds of others. Individually, not political novels, but together make a political statement. Women writers, worth studying, worth reading. Polemic, politics, lit crit, history, memoir, science. There is nothing women can't do or write about. And out of the great writers we published, including Marilyn Robinson, Angela Carter, Sarah Waters, Sandy Toxvig, Sigrid Nunes, two I want to mention, Maya Angelou and Margaret Atwood. Margaret Atwood has been with us since 1979. You can possibly imagine what it was like for me, who had studied her at university, to be part of her British publishers, to be publicizing her novels the edible woman, and surfacing. It was thrilling for a young Canadian. A writer always ahead of her time, always putting women at the center of her fiction. They motor her stories. She is utterly brilliant, funny, wise, courageous, my heroine, and a writer and a woman who represents all that Virago aims to be. Maya Angelou coming into our lives was profound for me. Her astonishing memoir, entitled I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, was first published in America in 1969, and she told us that it was turned down by British publishers because they said nobody here would be interested in the story of a young black girl growing up in Southern states, until Virago found it 15 years later. Readers loved her for her belief in speaking the truth, but also in the power of poetry and because she encouraged us to share her mission in life, to not merely survive, but to thrive, and to do so with some compassion, some passion, some humor, and style. Today, those authors and others, such as Sarah Waters, are celebrated writers, celebrities even, and Virago had to learn to step up to their increasing popularity. Easier in some ways, once we were part of a large publishing conglomerate, with strong sales outreach. We learned how to play a new game, to work with film and TV companies, to produce tie-in covers. Our publicity teams had to become adept at handling the phenomenal media interest that comes with celebrity. And we had to continue to show authors and agents that we could meet the demands of the massive readership for these writers. A publisher must be worthy of their authors. We are their vehicle to success and cannot expect blind loyalty, and nor do we. Publishing, like most artistic industries, depends on bestsellers to balance the books and to compensate for the fact that probably about 80% of the books we publish either lose money or break even. Prizes, which are fantastically arbitrary, and best-selling authors are crucial to us. Not only do they help us by making a profit for us and the authors, they also promote what Virago set out to do, to change the landscape of publishing and bookselling and to bring the voices from the margins to the center. I want to finish by briefly mentioning the joy of publishing a book myself and seeing it published, my memoir about Virago a Bite of the Apple was published by Oxford University Press. I have always walked alongside my authors, held their hands, took the flack and praise alongside them. Though that is true, ultimately there is just one name on the book. The rest of the author's publishing team is behind them, 
but the author is out front, alone, exposed. That has been salutary. And even though I worked with over a hundred authors, sometimes line by line, I don't think I had appreciated the sheer stamina it takes to think, to write, to rewrite, to edit, to dig deep, to complete a book. I have come to completely appreciate the help and support I got from my publishing houses here and in Canada. I loved working with my editors and I found the process of being on the other side illuminating. I saw how it feels to hand over your creation to others, to mold, to copy edit, to provide a jacket and a market. I have come away with an even greater respect for the people on whose shoulders the entire publishing industry stands. The authors. It was the author, Maya Angelou, who said to us publishers, you must take your job seriously to be aware of the power you have to know that somewhere out there, someone who you will never know will pick up a book you've published and find a friend. We must listen to authors. They are the ultimate game changers. Thank you. Well, wow. Thank you, Charmaine and Lenny. I found what you said utterly compelling, and I hope that all of you people listening and watching did too. If you want to explore any of this with them directly, come along to our live Q&A session at 5 p.m. this Wednesday, 13th of January, or if you're watching this live later today. Our Creative Women Creative Business Festival continues on Thursday the 14th and Friday 15th of January. Please do join us for our four practical talks on publishing, design and comics. These are all free to attend, just sign up via the British Library. Hello and welcome to Creative Women, Creative Business, Feminist Publishing, Design and Comics, a three-day fantastic festival for free organised by the Business of Women's Words Research Project in collaboration with the British Library. My name is Polly Russell. I'm the British Library partner for the Business of Women's Words and I'm also the lead curator for the exhibition Unfinished Business, The Fight for Women's Rights, which is currently being staged at the British Library library, although tragically because of COVID, is not at this moment uh, open. It is, however, running until August, so I very much hope that many of you will be able to visit at some point in the future. Um, I am absolutely thrilled about this three-day festival and tonight's event. It is absolutely right that the festival is running alongside the exhibition, which in so many ways celebrates women's tenacity, their ingenuity, and of course, their fantastic creativity in demanding rights, in changing the world, in creating space, and of course, in earning a living. So it is wonderful to be hosting this event. We're kicking off the festival today um, um, with this event with two women who have shaped, challenged and changed the publishing sector in this country and indeed around the world. They have already recorded a fantastic set of keynote speeches, which hopefully some of you have already listened to. In fact, I can see that you've already listened to those. Um, however, if you didn't have a chance to listen to them, they will be live for the next seven days. So it really is worth going to listen to those pre-recorded conversations. Um, we are now, however, going to go live to have a conversation with them, which will be chaired by Professor Margareta Jolly, Jolly, who is the project lead for the business of women's words. I know this is going to be a brilliant event. I can't wait to hear from them in conversation, but we also can't wait to hear from you. So please do use the question function on the um, screen in front of you and send us your questions because I know that the panelists, uh, Lenny and Charmaine, are really excited to hear what you have to say as well. A couple of housekeeping points, I'm nearly there, and then I'll hand straight over to Margareta. Um, we have a bookshop on the uh, website too, where all of the um, contributors and panelists from the whole festival, their books, publications um, are there. This would usually be a British Library, uh, the British Library online bookshop, unfortunately, because of COVID that's not running. So we've linked to uh, individual ind independent retailers. So please do check out those books. Also, I just wanted to mention, we hope that you will come to as many of these events as possible over the next three days. They're all going to be amazing, but there are also other events from the British Library going forward into 
the future, which I think really resonate with the subject of this festival and of tonight's talk, uh, including the amazing cartoonist um, Alison Bechdel is doing a talk, um, the, create, the creator and artist and writer uh, Laurie Anderson is doing an event for us later in the month, and we also have the fantastic economist Mariana Mazacuto in conversation with Gillian Tett on the 26th of the 1st. So uh, this is three days, an amazing three day sprint and marathon, but keep on with us throughout the month. Finally, please, please do ask questions. Just as a reminder there, I'm handing over now to Margareta. I look forward to seeing you all through this week. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Polly. Um, and again, welcome to our wonderful Festival of Women's Creativity and Enterprise. Creative women, creative business. I'm so pleased to welcome back our two speakers, Charmaine Lovegrove and Lenny Goodings, following their fabulous talks earlier today. Um, for those of you just joining us, uh, Charmaine is the publisher of Dialogue Books, an inclusive publishing house which builds on her pioneering work in press relations, book selling, events management and TV scouting and more. And Lenny, Lenny Goodings is chair of Virago, the legendary publisher of books by women. She's a writer as well and her terrific memoir was published earlier this year, A Bite of the Apple, A Life with Books, Writers and Virago. So I'm going to start with some ideas for discussion, but as Polly said, what we really want is for you listeners to give your questions or comments. And again, that should be easy. Just use the box at the bottom of the screen and we'll pick them up as they come through. Um, but I should say, Lenny and Charmaine, you may have questions for each other, of course, and we'd love to hear you know, your comparing and contrasting your, your own very rich experiences. And to that end, I thought I would start by just filling listeners in of whether you two know each other and how you two know. How did you two meet? Maybe Charmaine, start us off. Hi, um, thanks for having me. Um, so I've known about Lenny and her work for Virago for many, many years. And I actually watched the documentary on Virago a few years ago. I think it was in 2016, 17, and um, was just really inspired by that journey of what it means to create something um, from the need um, of women's voices within um, publishing and literature and our society. And so when I met Charlie King, who is the MD of Little Brown and was sort of talking to him casually about publishing and diversity, then I brought Lenny and um, Virago up and kind of, you know, it's been a really inspiring, um, Virago and Lenny have been really inspiring to me um, in creating dialogue. And now we're colleagues, which is, which is great. Thank you, Lenny. So I remember I was at um, a Women's Prize for Fiction party um, in the days when we did those glamorous things. And um, suddenly Charmaine was in front of me and I said, oh my God, here we are. We're now going to be colleagues because I had already heard she was joining us and had to bring dialogue to us. But I knew her through um, the, for Elle, when she was the literary um, editor at Elle magazine. And um, yeah, it's great. And so now we are colleagues, though we weren't much together in the office, it has to be said. <laughs> We've seen each other more on screen than in real life, but it's great. And I really welcome dialogue to Little Brown. It's good. It says, Little Brown is a smart publisher. It welcomed Virago in 1992, and uh, 1995 rather. And um, I have witnessed how, you know, when you take a press like us, we were already fully formed and we arrived. Um, I've always been very interested to see whether you can grow an activist press within a conglomerate. And I've seen that Charmaine is doing it, and I'm impressed by that. Well, that was, in fact, my next question was the fact that both of you are working as imprints within a conglomerate, within a, what might appear to be a very large global, you know, traditional business. Um, I thought it'd be helpful to, uh, to, to reflect on that, um, particularly having, in Virago's case, been mm. a, a very proudly independent Yeah. Press. I mean, it raises so many questions about feminist business models, and there's, there's a lot of passionate debate on whether there should be a particular type of business model, and should it be independent or cooperative or collective, or how do you transform from within? And I, I did 
well, I would love to hear uh, your view on that. And, and maybe also just to explain to listeners what an imprint is, because not everybody may understand how you are, you are imprints within yeah. Little Brown. Well, so Virago was founded as um, even an association to begin with in 1973, Carmen Khalil founded Virago and it was originally associated with, associated with quartet. And up till where we are now, this is our seventh form of ownership. So we've had independence, management buyouts, part of conglomerates, in and out. And now, you know, we're, we're at home. Um, as I said, in 1995, we sold ourselves to Little Brown. What an imprint means is that you don't take responsibility, cash responsibility for everything. So what an, an imprint in companies like um, Dialogue and Virago are in, Little Brown is we're, we're more like an editorial imprint. And we have our we have people who specialize in our publicity and our marketing and even design to a certain extent. But then we share all the things that we had to manage when we were independent. You know, we had to obviously had accountants, receptionists, production department, etc. So you share all of those things. And you still, you pay, I mean, the way it's organized is that, you know, you don't get a free ride. Um, you know, your, you, your, in, your imprint has to bear certain parts of um, overhead. Um, why I said it has been a good place, and I, I imagine Charmaine will say the same thing, actually. Is, and well, no, I'll start from a different place because Virago was fully formed. So we came there in 95. We'd already been going for years, for decades, actually. So we the, the company knew what they were buying with us they knew what we were that we were a, a feminist publishing house they knew we had the virago modern classics all sorts of things and they honored all of all of that so we but we were fully formed it was like you know you know buying a grown-up <laughs> whereas with dialogue it was a, a sort of baby wasn't it a baby idea that has had yeah. And that, that is different. And, and what I had always said until I witnessed dialogue, actually, what I had always said is that I don't know how you can be an activist press within a conglomerate because the, the tensions are different. You know, the, when you're starting up a press, you have to probably lose money for a while. You try certain things out. You know, profit cannot be your only motive. Um, whereas within a conglomerate, obviously, that is the motive, isn't it, is to, to keep on making money. So. It's a, it's a balancing act, of course. Publishing always is a balancing, balancing books in every sense of the word. Um, but anyway, Charmaine can talk about being, uh, growing from nothing to um, a successful. Okay. Charmaine, jump in there. Yeah, so Dialogue was just sort of a seed of an idea and um, to become an imprint. And it was sort of taking that inspiration from Virago and how successful it had been in uh, creating space for women's voices within the publishing industry and for readers. Um, and yeah, it's a really it's a really interesting conversation of like, what does it mean to be at once activist within a corporate space? Um, and but the, the thing is, is that I think the, the flavor and the technique comes from the person that's running the list. And I am uh, resolutely, as um, Lenny knows, resolutely an independent person and an independent thinker. And actually, um, I'm not really, I've never worked in a corporate environment before. So it wasn't, it actually wasn't that difficult for me to kind of like be in my own lane with my own vision. Um, but it, what, what really helped was um, I can really focus on um, the books, the authors, the editing, knowing that the sales, the distribution and the production side of things are taken care of. So I'm not kind of mired as sort of a single person. I'm not sort of mired in having to really um, dig into all of those things every day, um, that I can really think about the culture that I want to create and um, then lean upon others when, um, when I need to. And I think that for me, that's really, really, helpful and for an activist imprint it's helped to give us um, a voice and foundation and kind of create a, a brand around um, our culture that's become distinctive quite quickly because um, I'm not really um, distracted from the sort of the mission um, by worrying about printers for example mm. um, and, and that kind of really frees me up for the activism side of the role. Well, that's right. That is, uh, I, that's absolutely right. And when we joined, we had, we suddenly got an amazing international reach that we hadn't had. 
I mean, you know, it isn't always a happy marriage. I'm not going to say every imprint within a conglomerate is, is, um, is always good, but in our cases, it has been very good. It's not, when we sold ourselves to Little Brown, Little Brown was actually owned by Time Warner and then Time Warner sold itself to Hachette, which is who owns us now. And they are a much more um, sympathetic organization. And I remember the first time I met the, the whole boss of um, Hachette if, in France, here, he came over to, and his name is Arno Nouri. And I remember saying, hello, I'm Lenny Goodings from Virago. And I thought, you're not gonna have a clue who I am. And he went, you published the books that matter. <laughs> so, I thought, so I thought, oh Lovely. good, we've come, to the, we've come to the right place. Okay, well, I'm, 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 I'm going to sort of pause at that point in the sense, I think this, again, this opens up the, the really big question that we, we want throughout this festival to debate, which is how you pursue you know, ethical business and there is there are I think what you're saying is there are different routes and different ways and one can work in, on the face of it apparently with insight within something um, that isn't owned by feminists or owned you know independently or whatever but I think we'll 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 ne I'm sure come back to that but I can see lots of questions coming in um, and I think uh, just picking up Lenny your point about international reach and um, this is this is a question from Michelle who says um, what are your recommendations for women from less visible ethnic minorities Pacific Islander in acquiring literary representation um, and uh, just a second I could find by the rest of the question when there is little effort in inclusion in mainstream literature what trends are you seeing in terms of DEI to change this internally in publishing houses and literary agencies? So I think that puts together some of the really burning questions about representation okay. and inclusivity, but with, with also um, uh, the, the question I, I think we can add to that of, about reach and not necessarily the most obvious exclusions. And um, maybe Charmaine, do, do you have any comments? Yeah. On Sure. I mean, what's really interesting is that I've, I've just before this uh, panel, I just got off the phone to uh, one of the, an agent at one of the biggest literary agencies that just pitched me a book by a um, native indigenous um, American. Um, and I just, you know, the, I think, you know, the, there's a lot of different barriers to entry within the publishing industry, but I also think that it's really important to understand writing um, and different forms of writing as well. And there's often, um, sometimes I do think it can be too easy to say that because someone's from a particular protected characteristic that that means that they're not able to do something and as a black woman like I've never ever thought that I couldn't do something because of my race and I understand totally why other people um believe that it's um a hindrance but I think when it comes to your art you have to absolutely like push through and find um if not similar um, but sense of like similar types of people and similar types of sensibility. I mean, no, no one's really sort of writing in a vacuum, even if you have very unique experiences um, from like the specific I Pacific Islands, for example, there'll be someone somewhere who has written around what you're writing and the, the, the role of the writer when finding an agent, the right agent is to look for like-minded people and to look for the sensibility, the understanding um, and the sort of the culture. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to look like you or they have to be a person of color or they even have to be a woman. It, what it means is that um, they have to be able to, you have to feel like they're going to understand your work for what it is outside of your own protected characteristics. And I kind of feel like as artists, which writers are, that's the best sort of gift that you can give yourself because in the end you don't just want people from where you're from to um to you don't just want people um to read your work from the same background as you you want millions of people all over the world to to hear your voice and so it's really important to find the right 
people from the beginning and they could be from from anywhere but it has to be about sensibility of language um, and often if you look at the back of your favorite writers and you look in the acknowledgements then you can see agents and um, they always thank their agents and then maybe those are the agents that you reach out to. I, I want to follow this with a, a question around translation. Um, I was very struck um, again, Charmaine, with your story about moving to Berlin and the, the kind of transnational um, perspectives and, and mix of languages there. Um, and it raised to me a related question around um, the politics of translation and, and obviously just the, the practicalities and, and economics of translation and translated literature. I wonder, Lenny, if, if Virago has um, any, any translations that you know about or any views on the role of translated authors and how to kind of break the dominance of English language as one aspect of, of I think, the... Um, you know, the, the, the limitations and inequalities of, 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 of culture, really. I think it's, it is tricky. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you know, unless you're speaking those languages, a bit like what Charmaine just said, actually, is, you know, you have to have a knowledge of the area. Um, it's very difficult for, you know, editors, if you only speak English, for one thing, um, obviously that still takes you right around the world, but it doesn't take you right around other languages. And the dynamic on the whole with British publishers has been American, you know, English language. These are the two biggest English language um, uh, countries in America to, to Britain. And we also, we, we share a lot of sensibilities, don't we? Um, or in Canada from where I come from. Um, so that is tricky. It's also expensive. Um, I, I did a book a year, years ago called A Woman in Berlin, which is an amazing book about do uh, you know, uh, it's anonymous actually, the woman who wrote it was about the sacking of Berlin. And we first tried one, a very famous um, translator and the estate didn't like it. So we had to trash that entire <laughs> translation and start again. I mean, luckily we were sharing the cost with the, with an American, but you know, so there's a, there are a lot of barriers to it actually. And I, but I'm this, this autumn, I'm publishing a, call, a book called The Book of Mother by Viola, uh, Violin Hussain. And um, I just, I didn't, I haven't read it. I mean, I'm now read it in English, but I bought it without knowing. I just read everything about it. I, a lot of people recommended it. And, um, but it's a jump, isn't it? That, that's a big leap. And I'm not sad I've done it, but um, you, you have to be cautious with it. It's, and sorry, I just one more thing to say is we haven't exactly got a huge appetite for translated language, or, or, um, works in this country. I mean, it comes in fads, if you think about it. When I first came into publishing, it was uh, sort of um, South American publishing. If that's how you got Elizabeth Allende, et cetera. And then, then there's Scandi, or, you know, you have, if publishing is like other areas of entertainment and education and stimulation, which is, it does go in, in, in waves. And so you get a popularity. And once you get it, like uh, now we all understand Scandi crime, do, don't we? But, you know, that would have been something to break through initially. Um, well, I, th I think we, we can move to some, we've got quite a few questions that, that are coming in that are about a particular um, interest, which is about um, making your way in this, particularly in the context of pandemic times and, and the, the challenges at the moment. I mean, we have um, some lovely uh, tributes to your talks. Um, engaging talks um, but for example Coco Nina says do you have any advice for a recent English grad looking to start a career in publishing during this pandemic um, and we have um, another related question from Pippa Sturck saying do you have any advice for unagented writers trying to carve out a niche in writing that is explicitly for and about underrepresented groups so I guess that's from the wanting to get into writing and publishing as a writer and there's also how to get into publishing as a publisher um, and, and perhaps you might both reflect on some of the other jobs that are available that aren't just editorial um, I think sometimes people don't realize the range of work that's involved so Charmaine maybe start us off on that yeah so I think it's important to understand that um, it's not just a, um, you know, an English 
literature degree that makes a great publisher. It's a an absolute need to want other people to share in what is the transform transformative experience of reading. And so it's less about yourself and it's more about the other. And I think that that's sort of one thing that I really notice that's incredibly lacking when people um, apply for jobs within publishing. It's always like, I've read lots of books and so therefore I should work in publishing. And it's like, you know, that's like a part of what we do, but the, the drive in the morning when um, we wake up, especially as imprint heads, as publishers, is to think about that, you know, that sheer joy of the, the numbers when you start seeing tens of thousands of people reading a book that you know, that you love, that you stayed up um, till two, three o'clock in the morning um, reading and knowing that that's shared with, um, with tens of thousands of people and has the ability, even if that doesn't always work out and just the constant drive to, to make that happen. And that's also, negotiation so working with lots of different teams um so from the sales team who take um so if i start from the other side you get the a manuscript from an agent um then when you when you acquire the book you work with the contracts team um who do all the contracts to ensure that we've got all the all the rights that we 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 need um, then it goes um, through the editorial department then it goes to production um, the design team are also designing the um, designing the um, the cover then you have um, the rights team who are talking about what rights they're going to sell and um, that you've acquired then you have the marketing team publicity team who are looking at how to spread the message about the book and then you have the sales teams who work really closely uh, with the retailers and sell the books in and pitch them to the different retailers and whether that be Amazon Tesco's or Waterstones or Independence so there's a really wide range of people that that you're talking to um, and all of those people are sort of on the same mission as us as the publisher which is to ensure that the most amount of um, copies of books go to the most amount of um, people and the most amount of people hear about it and it all starts with that that email that you get with that manuscript um, and your initial love as the commissioning editor. Did I miss anyone out Eleni? <laughs> uh, the reader. No, <laughs> I, I, I always I always say about publishing too is that it doesn't matter how technical we get, uh, technological we get rather, and how um, you know how far it gets away from the old pen, right? Actually writing on the page, we publishing is still about one person telling another person you must read this book, and you know I do love that. I agree with Charmaine. That's at the sort of the heart of it. So you have to have that drive, but I would say in terms of getting into publishing. I would do everything that you can think of around publishing. I would, you know, run your own blog. I would uh, work in a bookshop. I mean, Charmaine's career is a very good example of trying lots of different things before she became a publisher. Um, you just have to think that, you know, the competition to get into publishing is obviously quite stiff. And first of all, don't only head for editorial. I totally agree with you there. But secondly, really do your homework. You know, I, I would say it's a bit like what Charmaine was saying earlier about to the writer who wants you know read around your subject you know think hard about it don't think unfortunately you know no one no no one is owed either being published or becoming a publisher you know you do have to earn that space i think actually um yeah. and i think but i think if you really want to i i think i sorry i don't mean to be like americans saying if you if you really dream you'll get it i don't want to do that but i do think if you really set your cap for it, I think there are ways to get into it, and there are um, there are way there are other ways to show that you want to get into it too. So when we get letters from people applying to jobs and they've done a series of things, they've run their newsletters to certain places or whatever, you know, you 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 believe in their commitment. Um, okay, thanks, thanks very very much. I mean, I you know we we all know it is these are really unprecedentedly challenging times but um i i found listening to your your own getting over challenges in the past actually quite um quite encouraging um times have been difficult before 
Um, I, I wanted to um, ask a question here that maybe goes to that, that history, I guess, that you were both sharing with us. This is from Sophie. As two women who have accomplished so much within feminism in the publishing world, what would you say has been the biggest breakthrough moment for you or female writers or publishers in general? And uh, I think that's quite a, a lovely question. Of course, it is a, yeah, it's a, it's a big question. I think what I, what I would like thing. to say. Yeah, sorry, well, Lenny, go ahead. No, I don't, I'm not even going to say, I'm going to say one thing. I think what, you know, when I, when you've been in publishing as long as I have, and, you know, I've been at Virago for 40 years, for God's sake, I can't believe it myself, frankly, but anyway, I have. Um, and I've seen lots of different, you know, I've seen the different waves of feminism, as we call it, which I, I mind, because I, as I keep saying, waves are all about ebbing, aren't they? Ebbing and flowing. But as we know, progress doesn't go straight. Um, what I would say is that, yes, we are so far from where we should be right now. I, I'm, I'm talking about... Um, gender politics and equality. We are still far from where we should be, but we have actually come a really long way in, in my lifetime. So when, when I started in publishing, there was even an idea that people were, women were waking up to the idea that they had opinions, that they had opinions that were worth publishing. And, you know, the, and that women would take, you know, the, the radical thing doesn't feel very radical. And that's why it's, kind of, this is the exciting thing. The radical thing is that women would take a decision about what would be published. That was radical. And so that's what I would say. You know, you have to, uh, far from being there, but take some cheer in how much we have progressed, I would say. Okay, Charmaine, can you pick any one breakthrough moment? I think it's the, for me, it's the getting closer to the realization that we're not a monolith, um, either as women or as people of color or from different um, sexualities or um, abilities or disabilities. You know, I think that, that we're getting closer to a point in which we understand that there's a multiplicity of um, person and that as an individual that um, we we don't speak for any one group that we we can share ideas um, and that we can be entirely intersectional in our thinking without it being contradictory and i think that to me that feels pretty um that feels pretty radical because um and really necessary actually you know i'm the first black person to be running an imprint at a corporate publishing house and so for me it doesn't at all feel like we've come very far because you know how is that even possible in 2017 and how has no one else joined me by 2021 um, and so I'm still on this huge journey we are still on this huge journey um but so i take the individual what i'm looking forward to is when um more black people join me um at my level and higher um and our mds and ceos in the future that we'll see that like women are not all the same um then black people are not all the same as well and for me the fact that we're getting closer to something of that understanding is you know that we we need more than one yes is um is hugely important to me um well uh, if, yeah. may, may i come in here with a, a slightly challenging question on uh, in that of course i think what you've both said everyone will resonate with um, but this is a this is a very practical question around marketing that I, I wanted to ask you again, going back to, in a way, the tensions between business imperatives and all of the brilliant kind of representational work you're, you're both doing. Uh, this is a question about um, the way that often uh, cultural products are marketed in very reductive, stereotypical ways. I suppose I'm picking up on what you're saying, Charmaine, about the the need to to show women are not all the same black people not all the same the the differences the specificities the diversities within all of all of our communities and yet i think marketing often goes for making something look 
a predictable, stereotypical, same, samey kind of face, if you see what I mean. And I, I just was really curious how you, uh, I know you're not necessarily in charge of the marketing actually, but how do you in your particular um, houses manage that? And I, I thought maybe we could look at um, some of the book covers. Uh, if, if we could see slide three, some of the lovely books that Dialogue Books has been bringing out. I suppose really you've got to show instantly what the face of the, of the product is. This shows a lot of different different yeah, so types of stories. So could you just talk to that question? Yeah. So you know, for me, I was a literary editor at L. I have also um, I've run my own bookshop. I've worked in bookshops since I was sixteen. I totally understand that people see um, the sort of the marketing or sort of the design of the book. Let's say it's not marketing; it's design that feeds into marketing and sales um, as being quite derivative. But there is a reason for that in a way. You know, we published in 2016, we published 165,000 books in publishing. You know, it's a phenomenal number. And in order for people to, readers to understand what it is that they want, then often they're looking for something quite quick that's visible, that looks like something that they've had we are not the only people that do that like you know when you go into a supermarket you know we have aesthetics for different groups of people and that's just how marketing and the world works um and what I try to do I'm just very design-led as a person and so what I wanted to do with Dialogue is um have the opportunity to have really bold covers that really try to tell a story and one of the things that I really love is say, if you look at the Old Slave of the Master of the Orange One, that was one of the first books that I published. It's a translation, um, it's by Patrick Chamoiseau. What I really love about this is that it's a slave narrative where I wasn't afraid of putting an actual black man on the cover. And I wasn't afraid of showing that when we're going to talk about slavery, we are talking about the bodies of black men. Stimmt, you know, it's like, Sorry, that's German for like full stop. Um, right. But it's like, <laughs> but it's like, it's it's so clear and so evocative that what 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 it is that we mean. There's no silhouette. There is a black body in all of the heat and the sweat and the pain and everything that this man has gone through in order to live his life, and that's what the story is 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 telling us. And um, with The Vanishing Half, you know, having the halves of the two sisters and the silhouettes that are moving. Some people said on Twitter, you know, it's really reductive having all these books with black, by black people where, the, where they're silhouettes. And, and they were like, look at The Vanishing Half, da, da, da. And I was like, but then it's literally called The Vanishing Half. Like, how right. can I not have a silhouette? <laughs> so, you know, remembered, again, it's just about bringing in that corn and remembering what the slave trade was about you know it's it's for me it's you know des the design is so important and I feel like our design team obviously Lay and I share a design team um, at Little Brown and I think they're really really incredible and they took dialogue on as a um, with gusto and really wanted to send the message of our books because all of our books are by marginalized writers so I'm very Thank proud you. of that. <laughs> I, th I think that's really illuminating and as, as you say just getting us to sort of the real you know the reality of what how, how one has to communicate and the structures within which we we live operate do business read create I, I want to now go to the slide one actually and ask you Lenny um, about the apple um, of, of Virago, um, and picking up in your talk, you, you, you did express very eloquently your discomfort with the terminology of brands and branding. Um, and you explained it in a way I found very beautiful, as in fact about loyalty and recognition. And I, you talked about loyalty. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought this apple is so recognizable and it's one of the distinctive elements of Virago is is if you like the brand but could you say something about I guess what what what, what this apple means to you what what you think of that again as a kind of very quick iconic way of communicating 
Well, if you think that the, t the two things that started Virago, one is the apple, the bite of the apple, you know, which we all associate with this sort of Eve taking the bite of knowledge, isn't it? And then the downfall of man ever since. Um, there's that. And then Virago, which means heroic, warlike woman, you know, if you or you know, that we reclaimed, if you think about something like Shakespeare, the taming of the shrew, you know, she was a Virago. So Virago started a bit like um, Charmaine's talking about dialogue to it. It started up front. You know, it said, this is what we're about. This is who we are. This is who we mean to appeal to. There are other, two other things about Virago, which is that we say, and I think Charmaine would share this too, actually, is that we didn't say we're just publishing for ourselves. You know, we started right from the get-go thinking not of ourselves as marginal. We might publish from the margins, but we published to the mainstream. We believed ourselves to be as worthy of notice as anything else that was in the mainstream. And to, to answer your question about brands and loyalties and, and things, I mean, I, I had said to you before, I used the word brand. I mean, Virago is a brand. We've been here for 48 years and we are known for, for what we publish. People understand who we are. But if the word brand has got so and correctly, it makes me queasy too, actually, because it's so commodified, isn't it? And it's so the complexity is bled from it, actually. It's very singular. But when I talk about brand, I would prefer, as I said in my talk, to talk about reputation. And I feel what we're, what we're talking about there is what we cherish about our books and what we want to say to the world about our books and what reputation we uphold. And we take that really, really seriously. And people feel loyal towards Virago. And, you know, that's not, thing, that's not to be taken lightly. And, and nor is it, you know, we have a heritage, but we have to look forward too. Do you know what I mean? It's quite a, it's a, it's a great blessing to have a, a, a reputation or a brand, but it's, you really have to handle it well. Thank and you, thank you. Um, I'm, okay, if we can go back to um, showing us, thank you. Um, I'm going to come in with a, a, a sort of related question about, well, I think which is about appreciating the art of design. Um, and, and this is from, I mean, the, the, I, and I guess the visual arts. This is from Ellen Francis, who says, is the conversation extended to graphic novels as well as just the written word? I know this is a sideways move, but I think very relevant to this festival um, in particular. We're interested in graphic uh, graphic storytelling um, and, and as well as literary storytelling or textual storytelling. So this, this question is followed. Is there anything to bear in mind going forward with graphic novels within publishing? We're starting to do graphic novels. Sarah Savitt, who is our publisher at Virago now, because I'm the chair, as you know, um, she has started doing some graphic novels and that's a new, that's another thing, you know, you must do as a publishing house too, is, you know, evolve, do, is stay, stay abreast with what's interesting and new. Um, they are quite tricky, <laughs> it has to be said, you know, because they're, um, you, you, you probably need a co, co uh, another publisher to share it with because it's basically an illustrated book. Um, but I, I think they're great actually. And I also love that you know, things like um, Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, not that we publish, that, but she's, they, they've made that into a graphic novel too. I think they're terrific. I think they're really, it's a very clever way both to reintroduce things that we already know about, but also or, or to do brand new things with, with uh, images and, and text. Really fascinating, I think. Okay. Well, I, I want I want to ask another kind of multimedia kind of question um, from Charmaine, inspired by Charmaine's um, experiences in television scouting and crossing crossing again the visual, the verbal, the uh, the, the broadcast, um, the magazine, and and now of course book publishing. Um, to ask, I suppose, in a way for up, up and coming uh, creative people, do you feel you need to, to be able to work across these platforms? Do, do you need to be able to broadcast, I suppose? What's the role of the multi-platform? Um, Charmaine, maybe you could answer that one. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really important to, again, think about what is it that we're doing? And really it's about audience and how do you communicate with audiences and you know when you think about 
a you know a really good friend of mine in Berlin and he is a, a television producer and you know some people are very snobby towards him and say why don't you make films like you know he's very intelligent so he should be making films apparently and he says well I love that I can make a show that reaches like 25 million people you know the like the reach of a show that I'm making is so huge and with with cinema um, it's very, very difficult to get those kinds of numbers um, and also to, to um, make something that's episodic, that's returnable and with characters that stay with you for a very long time, then that's also really compelling. Um, and I think there isn't anything that anyone sort of, I'm always, I find it very hard to say what anyone should or shouldn't do. I just think it's about sort of following this path and understanding where your sort of center of gravity lies. Like for me, I'm just really obsessed with like what speaks to people and different types of people. And um, and more lastly, I've been more obsessed with like who gets left behind when um, there is such a thing as a mainstream and who's not part of that. And so now that's like part of my sort of life's mission with um, with dialogue. But I, I also think that as a, as a reader that we don't just kind of live in a Silo, you know, it's not like I only read books and I don't watch television or like I, you what, know, what, I love what, photography. What are you watching? Can I can I ask? And what 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 TV do you enjoy? Um, so at the moment, I'm watching Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. Like I love watching um, television about food because I like I love eating. We're not going to restaurants, and um, my I, my husband's an amazing cook, and I basically get loads of ideas from <laughs> no no longer from restaurants, but from watching television of like what what he um, should cook for me. Um, I my friend made the show Unorthodox, which I just thought was absolutely um, incredible. Um, um, who's actually the wife of the of the husband that I just mentioned, who um, who is a film, a television maker. Um, and then I watched, you know, obviously I've been watching Bridgerton, obviously. Um, and um, I mean, I watch so many. I watch like, you know, I grew up in the eighties in England. Like, of course, I watch like Neighbours, and then I would also watch like Seven Up. You know, it's like it's it's you know, it's just. I don't, I think that I'm actually a lot broader in my television, in my visual taste than I am in my reading taste. I probably don't read as commercially as I watch, um, so, but I find it really interesting to kind of pick up on different types of dialogue and characters. And I feel like television really informs me um, and has actually made me um, a better publisher having worked in television for so long. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, Thinking this again raises actually underneath uh, bigger questions around how we change culture and how we use all these different platforms, whether we're doing it as, as readers or TV watchers or consumers even. Um, but um, before I come to that question, because I know we're, we're moving to the last section of this wonderful talk, I, I see a, a question I think is really um, a nice one, which I want to, to perhaps ask Lenny, which is actually going back to the literary character. So this is, um, in fact, it's responding to your speech, Lenny, where you mentioned that Virago editors, when considering a work, ask themselves, what truth does it tell about women's lives? So the question is, how does Virago feel about controversial, imperfect female protagonists, even anti-heroes, that represent the fundal, fundamental flaws that women as all people have? So, um, yeah, Bridgerton, great. I don't know. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, um, I, I am not a big TV watcher, it has to be said. Um, I'm, what I am more obsessed by is the written word and what I feel, I mean, that would be my food. If I go back to Charmaine's thing of eating, I feel like if I, I do feel quite nourished. It doesn't have to be great writing necessarily. I mean, although someone like Shirley Hazard or Marilyn Robinson certainly do, does that kind of feeding Maya Angelou, Sora Neale Hurston, you know, there are so many people, so many writers who do really, really feed you. I feel actually fed. And actually, if I don't read for a long time, I feel hungry. <laughs> you know, I can feel that too. Um, but to, uh, I don't know what, just help me out a bit more. Tell me 
give me a well, bit more I think this is this is maybe we can probably all think of some of our favorite anti-heroes or flawed oh yes that's right you know, sorry flawed, flawed characters who well are... we and we did a wonderful book actually it was published by ursula doyle at virago um by claire masood called the woman upstairs and people just I mean, it was fantastic. The woman had such rage. I mean, it opened, my God, you know, you felt the page was just hot when you opened the first page. And people had a lot of conversations then about how, whether or not we have to like our heroines. And Claire Massoud was great. She said, look, you know, it's not your friend, it's somebody in a book, you know, that's what you, you're reading other, you know, someone beyond yourself and not, you're not reading to have a best friend. You're reading you're reading for what Margaret Atwood would also say too, is that you don't read to say, you know, do I like this person or not? What you should say is, are they credible? You know, and so no, I'm very much for the anti-hero and I'm very much for the, also the flawed person. I also like novels that aren't perfect for that same sort of reason too, actually. I mean, I think it's, it's more, um, it's representative of who we are, isn't it? Mm, thank you. Well, we, we're getting quite a few, um, suggestions and comments around the, the big question of how do we make the industry more diverse and how do we change culture at, at large yeah um, and I'm, I'm, I'm liking the idea we're all flawed and we're all struggling together on this but um, I thought I'd, I'd focus that around a question of the idea of the game changer um, because you obviously I see you as both game change you are game changers that's that's true um, but Lenny, in your talk, you said you thought the authors were maybe the real game changers. Um, and I Margaret do. Atwood and Maya Angela. What about the readers? What about all of us who are listening to you and maybe reading or watching these TV programs? Do, See, do we, do, do, uh, do, does it have to, in a way, come from the the bigger public who are driving? Mm. You know, and and do they have? Do we have to be consumers to force that change, um, or could you be a uh, a reader without, I suppose what I'm really saying is, is the market a place that can be turned to anti-racist, feminist, inclusive ends? You know, I think because it can. there's so much there's debate around that. So, I, well, yeah. I, you know, I think again, what I said in my talk, and I'll, I'll be interested to hear what Charmaine says is about this, but my view is that the, the things, the industries, the institutions, they change in response to the social movements. And even though people say they want change from within, you know, people are, we are, it's it, the status quo is easier. And it's only, it seems to me, when movements come through and in, in these waves, as I was talking about, that force the change. And it, and of course they are readers, you know, they are, they are readers and writers who are saying, I am not represented. And they demand to be represented and they demand that the publishing houses change and, you know, and they will change faster of course, if they have those people who are demanding change in the publishing houses making the decisions. Charmaine, what do you, can the market be a, a place for, for justice and change? Yes, um, absolutely. I mean, you know, you, as living in the capitalist societies that we live in, then we vote with our, we vote with our feet, we vote, vote with our, um, with our cash and where you choose to spend your money, um, whether it, um, that be a small independent bookshop or at Amazon, like you're, you're, you're making, you're making conscious decisions, or at least you should be given where we are in time. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's, I, I mean, I can't not kind of go back the step because I just think, I think that it's quite easy, actually, to be a um, armchair renegade by buying in an independent shop or like, you know, watching something um, that you think is kind of worthy. And actually that's kind of quite passive. And I always will pay the highest amount of respect to the people who um, who put their head above the parapet, as I've seen with um, the, my co-organizers of, of the Black Writers Guild. And, you know, this summer, we, um, as we mourned and were horrified by the murder of George Floyd, then we got together over Zoom, obviously, and created a, uh, a new cultural institution that is basically taking publishing to task. And by having, by being empowered by the 
BLM movement, um, being empowered by the readers um, and you know the public um, for there to be just their outrage that we are even in this situation, um, and knowing that the structures within publishing needed to be changed, then we created a um, we're creating a new system of mechanism by which um, change will be um, accountable. And so by writing a letter to the biggest publishers um, in the UK and um, having meetings with them and spending, I mean, I cannot begin to tell you how I've already probably spent like 200 hours um, to um, help the BWG and by being a publisher in that space with 200 authors, um, you know, I'm just so impressed by the, the authors and their, their want, their desire, their need, not just for themselves, but for future generations. And um, as a publisher, then I'm able to kind of give insights into how the industry works. And so what I've understood more than anything is that by having knowledge, um, and using that knowledge for the greater good of other people outside of yourself is 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 the biggest gift that you can is you know is the biggest gift that I can personally give, and so yes, of course the consumer question is um, consumers are really powerful, but it it's it's very individually driven um, rather than collectively motivated, and then it's all a question of um, it's a question of taste. And then it's sort of everything, everything follows. But the reality is with consumers is that things have to be created in, in order for them to consume. So, you know, as someone that's not actually like a big fan of capitalism, then I also have a problem with kind of centering the consumer from that perspective, because I don't believe that they're the ones that are necessarily doing the work. That's, that's that, I think I think you've you've you beautifully brought things together there, and and I I do believe most of us listening are, are struggling with that, how to change things within a capitalism that we didn't choose. Um, but uh, I, I want to just pick out your point there that you set the black is the Black Writers Guild. Yeah, you set that up during the pandemic, and I think that's another hopeful sign that we can do things even when we can't leave the house. You know, um, so. That, that touches on some other questions, and, and I know we're coming to the end here, so I just want to get these in. Um, so these are practical questions, one from Angela Richmond Fuller about, uh, thanks for your engaging talks. Can you re recommend any online networks of women to carry on discussions about these engaging ideas? Um, and there's uh, one from, um, we'll just find where, Priscilla Gonsalves, I hope I'm saying that correctly, who uh, runs a literary salon in London and was like to hear about the one that you ran in Berlin, Charmaine, and said it would be amazing to get some names or social media links to the salons there in Berlin, as well as to get more knowledge and potential collaborations. So I think there's some general interest in how to connect, how to create these networks. I, I think they're all in going in the same direction and we want cultural change from all directions but if you have any practical pointers oh there was also one about how could they get hold of the virago documentary oh, <laughs> i think it's on youtube actually at least some of it is on youtube okay that was easy virago yeah. documentary on youtube well how and to, connect to networks or i think channels. you need to it just needs you need to trawl through websites it seems to me, I mean, Virago has, we have a new podcast called Our Shelves. We also have Virago newsletters, etc. And we started something before the uh, shutdown called Speakeasy, which was a bit like the salons. Um, but I think, you know, back to what Charmaine said earlier, go to the books you love, go to the authors you love and dig deep there and you will find, you'll find the connections, I believe. I really do believe that. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm really not a fan of just kind of, I mean, I always love to give props to people and work that they're doing, but I'm not really a fan of being like, okay, go to like, I'm not going to do the work for you. Like if you're interested in this stuff, then it's all there. You'll find you know? it. You'll find, you'll find it. it. And also, <laughs> no, but also like, exactly have courage, but you know, also that, that kind of tenacity of like working stuff out for yourself is part of what makes you who you are. And when you're in job interviews, et cetera, et cetera, then it's like, you know, you want to show that you're someone who figured it out and not just someone that 
like is told stuff and um you know i um you know today like my son asked me last week my nine-year-old asked me how um what was uh, what happened with the spanish in jamaica and i was like great that's going to be your afternoon project so this afternoon he's had to go and research it and he had to i was like you can use four bits of information from around the house and the internet and then you have to write me an essay and so he hasn't written the essay yet, but he says that he's been collating the information. And the reality is, is that what kind of person would I be bringing up if I just told him? Okay, you know? okay, okay. <laughs> we, so you you heard it. So. Get, get on with, do your homework. Um, I love it. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Um, okay, uh, I thought I do want to just show two more images, if, if we can. Um, the slide four and slide seven. Um, just to end on, you know, again, I'm sad, sad this is this is pre lockdown um, vision, but I think this is a vision of the fun of both of what you do and also actually the initiatives that you've both taken. Um, so slide four, which uh, is Charmaine in all the different groups and settings and uh, I hope shows your bookshop. Um, and then we also will just see the slide of um, Lenny's wonderful book, A Bite of the Apple, but also as I took a picture oh, of it in, in the Oxford bookshop window. Oh, thank you. Which is, uh, which again, to, to support the related businesses of like <laughs> independent bookshops that, it's, that we want to do. So thank you both for this genuinely stimulating discussion. And also, of course, the audience for your own thought provoking questions and comments. And we are on a journey together in very uncertain times. But as I've said, I found a great inspiration in your your own stories of how you responded to, to challenges very creatively and in times that also weren't easy before either. And, you know, look where look where you've got and look where we're getting. So again, um, please join us for the rest of the festival where we will continue to explore these ideas with practical solutions, I hope. Um, tomorrow we have three events on selling feminist stories, reprinting lost classics and making feminist comics to go back to the questions about design and, and uh, visual creativity and bring your pencil and paper for that one if you want to have a go yourself. And on Friday, we close with a panel debate on the feminist marketplace where we will continue these questions about living um, positively and progressively within a capitalism we didn't choose, but which we can sometimes bend towards the ends of social justice and, and creative inclusion. And if you miss anything, all will be recorded and available on the British Library's website. If you want to know more about the Business of Women's Words project, check out our blog. So thank you all and good night.